Welcome to A Shot of Facts. This is your girl, Deja Renee. And this episode is a shot of black love with Miss Carla Davis Luster. Now, Miss Carla is a Chicago native entrepreneur and author. She has her own fashion line. She leads a think tank for small business owners to network and collaborate. And she is also the author of The Woman Tales, which is a fictional novel about black love and relationships. So Miss Carla, how are you doing today? I am doing well. I thank you and I appreciate the opportunity to be on your uh, podcast, Asia. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. You know, I love interviewing entrepreneurs and especially, well, Black women, Black women that mm -hmm. we should all look up to. And so one of my first questions to you, since you wrote a novel about Black love and relationships, what is your perspective on Black love? My perspective on Black love, and I've been asked that question uh, quite a bit, is that um, it's some of the most connected, and when you find it and it's true and it's real, um, it's some of the, the deepest kind of love that I've seen. I've um, My novel is just, uh, it's not, you know, put together of my life, but it's uh, based on, I've done like interviews, I've been around a lot of couples all my life. Um, it's just like a, a uh, just a, a collaboration of a lot of information, just watching um, couples. I've watched inter interracial couples, I've watched all races and not to take uh, anything away from any other races, but when you have that black love, it seems like it's just so deep and it's just uh, connected. and. Um, we as a people have like struggled and went through so much and when you find two people that connect and meet and just can um do those things i think that it's a, a very sincere thing and it's like a deep rooted spiritual thing so i guess that's why i just i just love black love you know <laughs> so. i can I do. <laughs> but do you feel like there is a strain or a disconnect when it comes to black love because i hear a lot of people talk about how you know black love isn't the same anymore in comparison to other generations and like this generation of men doesn't do this and this generation of black women don't do that so what is your opinion about the disconnect that it seems when it comes to black love in the new uh or i guess current generations i think uh we've lost the um and I don't want to say everyone, I mean, because this doesn't, I mean, nothing that we will say will apply 100% across the board. And I'll just, you know, put that out there. Uh, I think, and when you do see a disconnect, it's because we've lost uh, some of the five key things that I talk about in the book. And I think they put it in my press release. We've lost the respect. Uh, we're not respecting each other. We're doing anything. You know, it's like this open kind of relationship. You know, I do whatever. We show up and you're with this person, with this person, and then I leave with you. Or, um, we're not honest, you know, we're not really telling and showing our true feelings. Um, I, I talk about that in my book, kind of like a rehearsed be behavior, you know, like on your best behavior and, and really you're not, you know, just doing the key things, honesty, respect, loyalty, you know, just being loyal and the communication piece. So all of that, um, when you're not doing all those things, you're not communicating and you're not uh, doing the things that help to build and keep the relationship going, that's where you have the disconnect. I mean, I could keep going on and on and on about different things that we don't do. You know, right. I'm just hoping that, you know, through this novel, people see all the different things that we're doing wrong. How do we get, you know, the real thing back? <laughs> so, so what is your opinion on ways that we can get the real thing back? Um, Just doing some of the things that I, you know, I, I said, I think the biggest thing it, with a couple is the c communication and honesty and just, uh, you need to know yourself first. You need to know what are the things that you like? What are the things do you expect out of a relationship? What are the deal breakers? What are uh, some, you know, the pros, the cons, the do's, the don'ts. Um, and I think those things, once you know what you want, you need to share them with your partner and your partner, hopefully that they or your spouse or whatever you're calling them these days, uh, needs to do the same thing. And if by chance, if you if you sit down next to each other and you listed out everything that you wanted and this person wanted, and you see that your list is like uh, miles away from what this person wanted, y'all not connected, you know? Right. But if you can find some kind of similar ground or common ground on there, not everything is gonna be 100%, then I think you got a chance and a shot at making it. <clears throat> Yeah, I honestly feel like people do not communicate, like you say, and overall with relationships, uh, a lot of people don't even really know themselves either. 
to even determine what they want out of a relationship overall. Especially now that I see with, I'll say my generation, how social media is such a huge thing with online dating, especially a lot of people and self, myself included, I feel like it's so many options now, especially when it comes to online dating, that no one is taking anyone serious anymore. On top of everyone <laughs> is super judgmental. And then that's where all the, you know, the judgment on black men specifically don't do this. And then black women don't do that. Like it, it, social media really puts a strain on relationships as well. <laughs> I tell you, Deja, if, uh, and that's funny that you should say that, uh, Black women don't do this. Black men don't do that. But I, th I think if you took a poll and went to every nationality or race that's around, you're going to find the same thing somewhere in there. You know, I think that there's a lot of stress and pressure put on um, black women, black men, you know, either one. Um, the expectation is up here. But everyone else, you know, they they're down here and they can get away with this or get away with that. Uh, prime example with women, and I can speak about black women because I am one, right. um, is that, you know, when we're talking and we're expressing ourselves, we come across as aggressive and angry and this, right. that, and the other. It right. could very well just be that, you know, hey, the way I talk, I express, I'm like uh, authoritative and I understand and I know myself and I'm confident. So okay. how does it, why does it have to be aggressive? rather than I'm just confident in myself, you know? So I think the expectations on us is too high. I also think with that, it's kind of stereotypes as well too that plays a part of that. You know, the angry black woman trope or, I, don't, I can't even really think of none for men right now, but I know the angry black woman trope is such a huge problem when it comes to dating as a black woman because a lot of people can take, even if you date interracially, uh, a lot of people will take whatever you say as you being defensive or as an insult or you can even take this beyond romantic relationships and let's say in the work role or any type of just relations that you have with people a lot of times with stereotypes what we say can be misconstrued because i don't know stereotypes they just don't understand <laughs> where you're coming from but i really noticed that a lot and i have to like make it a conscious effort to make sure I don't sound like I'm aggressive, but at the end of the day, they're going to believe whatever they want to believe. Absolutely. And, and you like, you may say something and someone has gotten offended and it's like, oh, she was aggressive. And you like, what? I was just like, just stating a fact and hadn't even thought about it that in that realm, you know? Right. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if we'll be able to change that, you know, and it, and it's, I look at it as it's kind of a shame that we have to basically, you know, come out of acting like we would normally act or act, you know, beyond ourselves because we're trying to please and fit in and stuff like that. I just hope that we get to a place where everyone can be accepted for whom they are. Yeah. Uh, be it, you know, uh, my culture is like this, yours is like this. I accept yours, accept mine for what it is. Definitely. <laughs> now, speaking yeah. about accepting people for who they are, and I kind of mentioned in the workspace, so I see that you previously worked in the corporate America like spectrum of industry. And so how did was I? That? So you worked in the food industry in corporate America. How was that? And really what made you want to transition into entrepreneurship? Um working, I mean it had it it had its pros and cons. Um I, I, I gotta say my business background, um, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I uh I worked at several uh you know, businesses. I worked for Allstate Insurance Company when I first got out of college. Um, then I moved on uh, to do some several other things. But where I landed was McDonald's Corporation, and that's where I'll, I'll you know start and talk a little bit about that. Um, I gotta say that it was tough, or whatever, because you deal with the public, you're dealing with the the politics of being in corporate. Um, it was good and bad. It taught me, uh, I think, my toughness, my um, just my business sense, and how to actually run a business and operate a business. You know, because as a manager, you you're there from giddy up to woe, and you're learning every aspect from you know how the inventory runs to running a P and L to making uh you know how do you get a return on your investment. You know, so um, I really got my feet wet because they pretty much you have you're running the show. You're dealing with people, you're hiring people, you're terminating people, you hate to do that. But um, 
I want to say that it gave me a base for basis for business. It brought everything that I had learned into school into perspective, and I was able to apply it there. So I want to. I don't want to just bam out and say, "Oh, corporate America is whatever," because it did teach me some great things. And right. and I, you know, I, I I got some. You know, I moved through the system extremely fast, which uh, was was you know good for me. But speaking to what we're talking about. Uh, sometimes you're in a room with your peers, uh, you know, white males, you know, and just everybody. And um, I found that you you really had to put on that poker face, like, you know, you're saying that you, you got to fit in and you got to do that. So that was kind of tough for me because, you know, I, I'm one that want to be myself. I want to be able to talk about and act the way I want to act. So you can't totally do that if you want to progress because if you like really honestly if you want to just uh do whatever you want or act whatever you you know if you just act you know in yourself there's a chance that somebody may not uh take that good and then they may be controlling your destiny meaning that they can put the check on your uh your paper and say whether or not you're going to move forward so it's it has its pros and cons but i once again i wouldn't trade it for the world because it really did give me a basic uh business sense i definitely can agree to that as a person who is working in a corporate setting now and then i have my own entrepreneurship ventures that i'm doing in my personal time i can mm -hmm. attest to saying that the technical training that I'm learning at work is really directly helping me with my, you know, entrepreneurship ventures as far as public speaking, as far as organizing things. Like when I hear people say just automatically, just quit your job, just be an entrepreneur. It's like, you need to plan B. <laughs> Make sure you have the money to quit your job. Like, don't just follow that whole yes. thing, you know, that you can just quit your job and become a billionaire overnight. Like, I definitely don't tell people just quit your job because that's not realistic. <laughs> mm -mm, not at all. And I don't think I answered the second part of your question, but uh, with all of that, um, there was at one point being in the uh, QSR industry, I was on the franchising side dealing with franchisees and I would go, uh, the team that reported into me, they, we went in, we went into stores and we graded the store and, you know, just told them all about their operations and left them with a checklist on what can help them do better, ultimately turn it into profit, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess I came to the conclusion that I'm doing all of this for other people. You know, I've always wanted to, you know, have my own thing. I'm like, I need to make a plan and work my plan. Like you said, don't just walk off your job. I mean, cause you do in the interim gotta eat. Right. You know? <laughs> so I, I, we are like 100% on the same page with that. Um, but you know, you have to uh, make a plan, you know, uh, you have to save, you have to just have a strategy. And that's what I did. I, I said, you know what, I'm going to do this until it works and, you know, works for me and it's time for me to move. I'm going to gather all the information and learn everything that I can, good and bad. You know, you learn, um, everything is a learning, whether you good, bad, or indifferent, it teaches you what you can do, what you should not do. And some things that, you know, it may be gray area, you decide which way that you want to go. But, uh, from that learning all of that, it caused me to want to do my own thing. And that's what, you know, and I just did it. So how did you get started? Like, what was the first steps? Did you start your LLC? And then we're going to discuss your fashion line and the book and also your other organizations. But how did you okay. start from that point of saying, hey, I want more for myself? Well, here's here's what was the great thing. I worked for the QSR industry. And um, during some of my reviews, you know, they would ask you, they always ask you, what are your five-year goals? You know, you know, that's a right. corporate question. What are your five-year goals? I'm like, uh, okay, well, let me tell you. <laughs> so uh, I made it known that I uh, originally wanted to be a franchisee in the QSR industry. I actually had the opportunity to become uh, a QSR industry a franchisee. Number one, uh, for uh, McDonald's, I had, once I left, I went back and I interviewed or whatever else. They had a five-year waiting list for me to stay in Chicago. I could have moved away and became one, but I didn't want to leave the Windy City. Uh, so that was out the window. Uh, when I was with, uh, I, I, I worked for several QSR industries. McDonald's was the first one. I got hired to go to Mrs. Fields as a regional vice president. And I worked there for like two or three years. And the, uh, the young lady that hired me got hired over to Burger King uh, Corporation as a VP and she took me with her. And so I went over to Burger King and did my thing and, you know, was a director and everything. And so I made it known there that I wanted to 
uh, eventually become a franchisee. So uh, they actually, they had an opportunity to arise uh, where I guess these Japanese guys were looking to invest in someone and they asked me, was I interested? Uh, the reason why I didn't take that, and I was on my way at that point, you know, trying to, you know, make my way out to become an entrepreneur. So I said, you know what, let me, you know, look at this because this could be, you know, they're putting up whatever, you know, this is a good opportunity. Needless to say, uh, it turned out that it wasn't as good of an opportunity that I thought, uh, because you always want to have someone look over and that knows a business that you're trying to do, right. give you some advice that you trust. And I had uh, lawyers looked over the paperwork and they said, you know what, you are going to be, you know, like, you know, the head, blah, 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 but you're really going to be only a glory fat manager because the way this deal is set up, you, I mean, you know, the sweat equity type thing that you're doing is like, this ain't gonna work in your favor after so many years. You're really not a franchisee. So I moved away from that and I just kind of researched what other franchises were, uh, would work for me. And I, you know what I said, I wanted to move totally away from food because food is 24 seven. You know, that is a huge commitment. All businesses are a huge commitment. That's a commitment. So, um, I, you know, someone told me you might, you might want to look at UPS, you know, operations and stuff like that. Um, so I did it. It was on uh, the top 10 franchise list. Um, I went and spoke to uh, some franchisees and we I, uh, we knew a person that was uh, kind of like a, uh, a big wig in the corporate uh, portion of UPS. And I like what they said. And that's how I wound up doing that. And then I got to set it where I didn't have to work on Sundays, you know, so with all of that said, that's kind of how I, I flowed. It, it was just, you know, one thing and I took my time. You know, I, I, I even looked at Subway. Um, I got approved to do that. Um, however, I didn't like the exclusivity rights because someone could actually put one right next door to you. You know, it's like, okay, you know, so I didn't want to do that, but here I am. <laughs> I didn't know that with Subway. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what they are now. I went and took the test. They said that I, I aced it or whatever, uh, that they wanted me as a franchisee, but I was like, I don't know. Um, and even where I am now with the UPS store, there's one on the on my block. Um, it closed about, I think, two years ago, but there was one right around the corner. Right. You know, that's a problem to me. <laughs> so are you looking so. to expand with your UPS, like, franchises are you looking to expand that industry i haven't asked uh actually i got asked maybe a year or two after i opened i've been there uh, i've had it for eight years um no <laughs> i don't know i mean uh, that um <laughs> i feel you I, I wanna, you know what at this but in this portion of my life i'm looking to do stuff that i like and just i'm not saying that i don't like it because it, it, it it's good uh whatever but uh I want to, I've always been a fashion person. I'm writing, you know, those are the things that I love. I want to do what I love, uh -oh. not what I like. Right. <laughs> now, speaking, of fashion, that up, you know? speaking of fashion, you own a fashion line and it's also a consignment shop as well too, right? So yes, can you yes. explain to the listeners a little bit about what is the KKTZ collection or is it the <laughs> Carver's Closet Retail? Because <laughs> I see the names. <laughs> and it's like all over the place. People are like, okay, can you explain to me what, first of all, let's start with the title. Um, the KKZT line is, uh, that's the name of the line. It is a Carlos Closet exclusive line. And it's something that uh, I'm doing with my kids. You know, they're 24 and 21 and, you know, it's got all the hip hop stuff. You're probably like, she's doing hip hop and she like about, you know, uh, so it's, I can, it's a collaboration with my children. And um, they say I'm a young soul. Most people like, uh, you know, your mom, she's like kind of cool. I mean, she's firm, but she's cool. Um, so the line is, you know, we do uh, like overalls, we do uh, sweats and, you know, just the whole kind of hip hop, young, um, young vibe type of line. And we just started, um, Carlos Closet opened October 23rd. It is a consignment in a retail. So it's like kind of three parts. You have the retail portion where we sell everything that everybody else sell, you know, all the stuff that you go in uh, city fashion, you may see it, you know, whatever, we sell that. Right. And then the consignment portion is kind of us being in partnership with um, anyone that has things that they want to sell, you know, it has to be in great condition. We like designer stuff. Uh, we love it with tags. If it's not with tags, it's got to be in uh, tip top, you know, condition, uh, gently used. And what we do is if it has tags, we're 50-50. Uh, we get 50 for, you know, working for you, selling it for you. And then you get 50% 
or whatever. Um, if it doesn't have tags, it's, it's a 25% return for you. And uh, we try to shoot it through uh, various uh, outlets and stuff like that. I even like try to shoot it on Parshmark or whatever. So we're trying to really work it that everyone, it's a win-win for everyone. And then uh, last but not least, the KKZT line, that's exclusive. Uh, me coming up with ideas or whatever else. I uh, graduated from Parsons the, uh, la last year, 2020, I'm still saying this year. Uh, last year I did a uh, online course for a stylist. Huh? I said, I'm still doing that 2022. So. Yeah, I'm still saying 2020, but we want to get out of 20, 2021. Know, right? it was <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of like just an exclusive line. We come up with ideas. Uh, we just dropped uh, what you call cold caps, uh, baseball caps where you can uh, rock your area cold and, you know, just fun things we're doing. It's still building, you know, we hope to see more. So it's funny because I actually interviewed a fashion designer and she also owns a consulting firm in New York. And I asked her her opinion about wholesale boutique buyers and things. And she was kind of against it as a fashion designer. <laughs> But okay. in a business perspective, I still feel like it's a great way to go. So what is your opinion mm -hmm. about actually creating it from scratch like clothing and wholesale buying to sell? I think any way that you can sell, do not cut off that avenue or that outlet. You know, um, as you can see, I got three different outlets. Everything that we're talking about, I got consignment going, we got retail going, and we got us making, you know, like starting from scratch. Uh, I'm not against it at all. Any way that uh, it works for you, I think that you should do it. You know, not everything, you know, and I get the designer's perspective, you know, just from being a stylist and, you know, going through all of the stuff, you know, uh, grad, you know, doing the uh, courses at Parsons. Um, I get that perspective. It is, uh, it's a pride in it. It's a joy and it's uh, your actual creation as opposed to you just taking something that has been manufactured and selling it, trying to get money. But I'm always going to look at it as a business sense. If it makes money, you should do it. You know, don't limit yourself to what it is, you know? So that's my perspective. I, I think you should do it all. Yeah. So where is Parsons actually located? Is that in the Chicago area? No, not at all. Uh, Parsons, I think that they have, uh, I want to say they're in New York. They're in New York. Have you ever seen Project Runway? Yes. <laughs> you know, when they go to get their materials and all oh, that kind of yeah. stuff, that's part of Parsons as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think their base is, yeah. Um, and the course that I took was online, you know, it, it, you would think that you would sit in the classroom, what you had to do, but yeah, I did all mine online. <clears throat> Oh, okay. Yeah. I just, I had no idea. I had no idea about the fashion industry. <laughs> just putting that out there. <laughs> but now I know you say your children are a part of it. So do they own the fashion line or do they help with the logistics of it? They, uh, they, they're owners. Yeah. They're, they're, they're my partners, you know, um, they help with the logistics. If, if I like throw something on it, like not mom, no, nah, that's that going to work out, you know? <laughs> They were like, nope, that's not going to work. And um, my son, he's uh, he's still in college. He's in his last year of college. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to win. I'm not going to win. Um, he, um, he's like into um, engineering, uh, graphic design, engineering, software, computers. Um, and he has kind of, he started his own little company called uh, 080 Studios, where he actually builds video games. And he's um, built about five video games. He had one he put out there. I think he had like 15,000 hits. Um, so he's into that. And then he's got like this real fashion thing. And he'll, he like, if you go on the site, you'll see the, the young lady that you'll see, she's got blonde, you know, got the blonde on, wig on and him, the, 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 those are my children. Oh, okay. um, and he's like, he models and stuff like that. My daughter, she's just got her hands in everything. She graduated uh, about two or three years ago from DePaul. Um, she's, uh, she does all my social media, my marketing. Um, she uh, has her own business going called Cashflow Unity. She works with like various artists and rappers and everything. And then she builds out all the websites. So she's just like, got everything going and she helps with uh, the Carlos Closet business. So they are definitely um, a very big support and help. Uh, but I told them ultimately, hey, you're my partners. Y'all got to make this work. <laughs> Don't make right. it work. <laughs> and God bless her because social media marketing is, that's a job within itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I ain't gonna talk about it. I was posting, I'll tell you, funny. I was posting Deja. And I guess I don't know what I was, whatever I was posting. She went out there. She said, Mom, don't post not another post. She said, Stop. 
to stop, okay? Get off of IG. I'm like, <laughs> it's so, you like, gotta know when to say the right things and have the right aesthetics and i'm like oh it's too many rules oh my goodness <laughs> i thought i was posing good you know she's like mom don't, don't do that <laughs> <laughs> well i think those are great avenues for just overall generational wealth that you are bringing your children into your businesses and helping them with their own businesses i feel like i'm bringing it back to the black community but i feel like this is yes. great <laughs> to aid in overall teaching people about generational wealth like I always yes. have a level of transparency with my podcast. And I was literally just talking to my mom on how in my family, we don't really have mo nodes of generational wealth. We don't really have it. And as me, I'm like the first generation who's trying to break that curse. And it's hard yeah. for people like me trying to build that foundation. But people like you are helping your children, <laughs> getting <laughs> started in businesses. We thank you. We need people like you. <laughs> Let me say this, Sasha. God don't put on you no more than what you can bear. You, you're doing this. And just me, I first of all, let me just say thank you for allowing me. I'm like honored to be coming on to your, this is your podcast. You could have said, no, I don't want to interview her. And I really thank you for that, for giving me this outlet because I'm trying to share my things. And I think that we have to help each other, but I want you to be encouraged because, you know, I, I'm sure people that you are like advertising to and they hear you, you're encouraging somebody as well. And it's not, you know, like you said, it, you don't have it in your family. It, yes, you do. You doing it right now and you just you know be steadfast or whatever else that's going to continue that spirit is going to continue and i think you just stand and believe it and be positive about it so i just like to give you your accolades and that saying uh thank you let's go into your other ventures now <laughs> Okay, no so problem, but be encouraged. Yes, thank you so much for that encouragement, though. I really appreciate it because I was feeling no down. Problem. Really we could talk about that later. <laughs> okay, okay. But going into your other venture, the Building a Circle of Friends, that is the BACOF, is a foundation or organization. It is a uh, it's an organization, but we're uh, in the process of getting uh, trying to get the 501 3C uh, because we have been uh, giving away scholarships. We uh, got it to the point. For the last two years, we've given away two scholarships, a thousand dollars each, to our college students. We originally started where's um, I'll just go back. It started with uh, me wanting to give a party to say thank you to the mailbox holders. I have um, a lot, you know, UPS has mailboxes, and um, my uh, mailbox. I think we have like a hundred and ninety, over two hundred mailbox holders, and probably over 50, 60, 70% are business owners because you know you don't want to work out of your house. Right. So I was like, you know what? This is like a good, you know, I said, you know, well, let's do a party and say, you know, let's give a party, you know, uh, finger food, whatever, make it whatever, just make it really fun. People can meet each other, uh, interact and, and this, that, and the other. We tried to make it fun. I said, we'll do a speed networking thing where we'll tell people don't talk to someone you already know. You got to talk to someone different, have your business cards, pass them out, tell what you do, inter interchange information. Well, it turns out, I mean, the party was a huge success. We had about uh, we had about 200, 220 people, uh, 220 people, not all mailbox holders because the word had got out to other people, business people and professionals. And we had, you know, some outside people other than mailbox holders there. We let people present, you know, we uh, had a, let a few of them present. I presented uh, just some services for UPS, of course, you know, because we were giving the party. Um, and it just went over very well. And they started asking, you know, after we gave it, they was like, oh, this is something that should continue. So uh, a group of people that work with me, um, along with my daughter is also a part of that as well. My son is not. Um, we uh, They said, well, let's just keep this going as an organization. And we, the next year, we said, well, let's try to get some sponsors and see if we can like give away something, you know, give away a scholarship. And so we said, well, let's do it for someone that's getting their master's or their PhD. Because the undergrad got a ton of, uh, you know, like uh, scholarships. Yeah. So we, we did that and we were able to give away two. And so the next year, people, you know, I had all state come to me and say, you know, we'd like to sponsor one of those scholarships. You know, I'm like, okay, you know, so uh, this is the reason why we're trying to take it to a, a you know, a, a non for profit portion so that we can, you know, help entrepreneurs, you know, and what we're trying to do is develop memberships. Whereas if you join as a member, um, 
as a member, what you'll get is the services of other members that do different things. You have accountants, you have real estate, you have teachers, whatever it is. If you become a member, if someone within the organization needs um, some kind of a service, you have, you know, you should discount it. So we're trying to work it all out in, in the interim. We're still giving away scholarships. So it's just a networking thing and just paying it forward. Hopefully you can join us one year. <laughs> how, is this gonna ask, how can people get involved? Uh, just, just simply, uh, we have, uh, we're building out a new website right now, but right now the, uh, the email is info at bakeoff.org, right here, in, in, info at bakeoff.org. And then, uh, the website is www.bakeoff.org. I don't, the website is being updated now, uh, but it's still up. And so you can just, uh, send us your information, subscribe, and then we shoot out different, um, Mail, uh, mail chimps and everything, letting you know what's going on. We do webinars. Uh, we uh, this past year we went around and we interviewed uh, entrepreneurs, and we put it out on our YouTube page for people to see it. And we just you know ask them different questions about their business and tried to showcase them. So, and that's something that we'll continue to do. You know, so send us your information. I will help you. I will. <laughs> <laughs> But I'll also make sure to add all of your information in the show notes as well, too, for the listeners and thank myself, you. especially. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now, going into your book, The Woman Tales. Now, can uh -oh. you explain, oh, <laughs> can you explain <laughs> to the listeners what is it about? I know it's about love and relationships, but it's also some type of, you know, sultriness to it and romance <laughs> and everything. So can you explain to the listeners what is the book about? Okay, just putting a uh, long story short, uh, it is a book about a couple and um, the couple steps out on each other. Uh, it, it talks about um, the other woman. It talks about the other man. Uh, it talks about a baby mama in there. And um, it's just like a whole lot of real life situations that actually can happen. And, and who plays what role and who did what to make this happen and how you behaved. Uh, with that being said, I don't just leave it at, you know, because many times when things happen, let's just take a mistress, you know, per se. Most people is like, they look at the mistress and they just hate her, everybody all oh, stoner, you know, stoner and, you know, set her on fire. Um, each character in the book, I kind of give a perspective and tell their, their side of the story as to what, where is their mindset and what made them and how did they get to that point? Believe it or not, and I'll just say this, chapter eight, you gotta buy the book, but chapter eight, the other woman actually tells her story and it takes a twist on how she actually came about being the way that she was. And listen to our story, it's never okay to you know put someone through misery or you know the Bible says don't commit adultery, but you might look at her and I don't want to say a different light because, you know, at the end of the day, you shouldn't be doing it, but you might not be so ready to stone her, you know, uh, and each one of those characters, including the male, which uh, he's not called a mistress, he's called a paramour, which that's French, um, his perspective of, okay, why did he, you know, like get with the wife, you know, so it kind of tells story, the story like that, and then it goes into accountability, you know. What are you accountable for? You know, does one wrong, you know, make make it right? Does two wrongs make a right? You know, so it, it kind of takes that kind of a twist. Mm, I feel like a lot of people <laughs> can relate to that. Mm. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but I definitely feel like I love fiction books. Oh my God. I remember in high school, like in college, well, college, I was so busy and depressed with schoolwork, but <laughs> I used to love reading books about like the fiction and like, uh, I don't know the actual genre of those books, but like, uh, God, I'm having a brain fart. You know, the Erotic, like, erotica. Or yes. I love, love. Have you heard of zany? It's got a little bit of zany in there too going on. <laughs> Which I, why was I reading this in high school? That's another story, but I love, <laughs> I love those books. So that's what the book is kind of getting me to feel of, which I'm going to need to cop. Yeah, it goes there. At oh. some point, you got a glass of wine, and you're like, Ooh, I have this phone number. <laughs> now, do you have an oh, audiobook yeah. version of it? Yes, uh, that is being completed as well. Um, that one should, uh, the audio should be out in two weeks or whatever. You'll be able to purchase that. Right now, we are doing uh, pre-sales. 
um, they should be in hand. Um, they're saying by end of week or the first of next week or whatever. So, uh, but I am uh, doing pre uh, pre sales and pre orders uh, at www.thewomantales.com, and I'm on Amazon, so you can get it either place. Okay, and again, you guys, I'll make sure to add all of Carla's information in the show notes. So you guys can cop <laughs> copy of because I'm getting my copy because I love books like this. <laughs> I love to live by care. Enjoy it. I love to live by carelessly through books like this. Like I think it might be a problem. But <laughs> it's, it's it's fun. It was fun writing it actually. It really was. <laughs> Yeah, but overall, I want to thank you so much for coming to the show and discussing your entrepreneurship ventures and the Woman's Tales book with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I've enjoyed the interview. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you again. And for my last <laughs> question, I actually wanted to go into our last call segment. And so this segment is where I give my guests their last opportunity to have any parting words or any words of recommendation or just a quote that you want to leave the listeners. So what would be your last call for this conversation? I use this quote a lot. Uh, a lot of people say there are things that, you know, I'll never do that. I'll never do this or whatever else. But here's what I say to that. Make believe and reality are only steps apart from being joined. Sometimes when you're put in a situation, you, it puts you there, whereas you you thought that you wouldn't do something, but then you change your mind and you wind up doing something you said that you would never do. Mm -hmm. I just tell people that take your take responsibility and accountability on your portion that you have in the relationship, whatever issues, whatever great things or whatever else. Just take accountability and take responsibility for it. Mm, facts. I like that. <laughs> Ooh, that's something we all can work on a little bit more. Myself included. All myself when it comes to accountability, definitely. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much, Miss Carla. Where can we find you? Social media, website, again, where can the listeners and myself find you? Okay. Uh, you can find me. Um, my IG is The Woman Tells. Um, I also, you can find me at uh, Shop Carla's Closet. Um, on Facebook, it is uh, The Woman Tells. On um, uh, I said I do already on Facebook. You can also find me, uh, Carla Davis Luster. I'm also on YouTube. When you uh, go to YouTube, you have to type you have to type in uh, The Woman Tells by Carla Davis Luster because there are other people out there with The Woman Tells. I'm not sure. Everybody telling everything, right? <laughs> uh, so you can, <laughs> everybody's out there telling. So uh, you can find me there. And then for uh, Building a Circle of Friends, that's uh, for IG. It's at Bakeoff org and then for uh, the website is info at bakeoff.org and then the website is www.bakeoff.org and I thank you so much. <laughs> now thank you again you guys. I'm going to foot stump this. This will be in the show notes. Please support Carla in all her endeavors. Please purchase the book. Please look up the Building a Circle of Friends organization. Please follow her on Instagram, on YouTube, everything. Support Black-owned businesses, you guys. But overall, I want to thank you again so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs>